Okay. So what we've got um, on screen here is one of the initial drawings that Andrew um, drew as one of the designs for the tapestry. So, and this one actually right up at the top of the cairn um, on the left-hand side, you can see a hand that's stretching out and it's holding some, it's meant to be lichen, which was um, one of the dye stuffs for Harris Tweed. Um, and that's actually just quite a nice link um, because this was the time when um, we had got this fantastic donation um, to the project of Harris Tweeds from Harris Tweed Hebrides in Stornoway. And Andrew and I would get very excited about all of these different colour combinations that um, we could use in the tapestry. Um, and that was kind of when um, Tweed became part of the project. Um, so that's why I've got this, um, I've got this picture in just here. And then on the right hand side, you can see some of the, diff you know, the different ways, uh, different kind of, you know, when we would put these colour combinations together and just get really excited because colour is such a big part of the this project. It's such, um, it was like Andrew always says, it's one of the things that kind of unifies people is um, the colour of the Highlands. It's it kind of everybody can coalesce around this idea of, of the amazing colours that you find in the Highlands and Islands. Um, so it's become a really, really important part of the project and and using tweed um, in the tapestry it, um, has just become this really um, integral part of it. Um, so these are some of the um, some of the examples of the tweed that we have. Oh, sorry, I've just clicked forward too quickly. Um, we've had um, donations from Harris Tweed Hebrides. As I said, we've also got um, tweed from the Isla um, Woolen Mill. Um, knock and do will and mill. I'm never sure if I say that right. Um, sorry about that. And um, King Craig's Abrora, there's some of their fabrics on the screen too. Um, we're also trying to get some from Johnson's of Elgin um, and there's other, other companies as well that we're sort of talking with. But this is one of, the reason why I've got this is because um, th this part, this screen is that because this part of the project has kind of evolved quite a bit um, with the involvement of stitches, which has been fantastic um, because people have have come and said, oh, could we use um, this tweed from this mill because it's it's in our village or it's in our town. And we'd really like, you know, there's a connection um, to the fabric that's made there. And 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 this is all part of the textile heritage of the of the region that we're really wanting to um, be a big part of the tapestry because it's such a big part of the story of the Highlands and Islands. So that just explains a little bit about the background of why we're using tweed and kind of what we've got to work with. And what I would say as well is that if any of you are in a group where you live, you, you know, you, you know that there's um, somebody who weaves tweed near to you um, that you would like to use or speciality yarns can also be incorporated. Um, but if if you do um, have any ideas about that, then if you can um, get in touch with us and um, we're always keen to hear about these stories because a lot of the time as well you know more about the places that are around about you than we do so um yeah we always welcome your ideas so um this image here is just kind of where um applique became part of um the design concept i suppose of the tapestry um with journey stones so um andrew's very um Andrew and I got very excited about this kind of concept of journey stones and um, individual journey stones, but also there's a lot of stones within the designs of the panels as well. Um, and so we talked a lot about how we were going to achieve that in textiles um, with this tweed. So the, the obvious thing to do is it was to be able to attach them in some way. So um, that was when we, we, we decided to use the plique. Um, these ones here were very early on samples, which were done with needle applique. The one on the left hand side with the larger shapes has got a heavy chain stitch around the edge of it. The ones that are on the top 
um, right hand side don't have an edging on it um, on them. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. Um, but it started off with um, needle applique. And I'll get what I'll do as we go through this. There's, there's three different methods that are suggested methods in the applique guide. And I was really keen to stress last night and tonight that they, they are just suggested methods. And I know we've got a lot of you know people on the project who have got a fantastic um sewing skills quilting skills dressmaking skills um you know who might have other there's loads of different ways of doing applique so if you have a way of doing applique that is different from this suggested method and you think that it would work better for your panel then um please just get in touch and you know that's that's absolutely fine because between us all 650 stitches um and me we've got there's a lot of um, knowledge and experience um, and that we really want to be able to draw on that base. So this is just these are just suggested methods that have been tried and tested and will work. If you've got other methods that you prefer or would like to use, then please um, just get in contact about doing that. Um, so moving on. The, the first one in the in the applique guide or the other thing to just mention actually is um, that the applique guide has evolved too. Um, and when I when it first went out, it just had um, one method with the bond web. But then that kind of became we quickly realized that actually we need different ways to attach these um, pieces to the fabric because a lot of that came about because of um, geography actually and time um, because a lot of groups don't live right on each other's doorsteps and we're wanting to be able to take away fabric to be able to um, stitch into and then to um, apply that to the fabric at a later date um, and one of the things if you're especially if you're using bondweb is that you can't um, you can't use that te this technique when you have already stitched into the tweed um or linen because what happens you need to have a, a really quite a hot iron for fused applique to fuse properly um and because we're using appleton's wools um that what actually happens is it can felt your stitches together um, if you've got a lot of um stitching on the tweed already it can felt them and it can flatten them as well um, so we want to avoid that so so that was why the guide evolved to have um three different methods rather than one and you know the guide might evolve further again um and you know i've even changed this i've added little things into this slideshow tonight that weren't in it last night because um of a bit of, you know feedback and questions that we had so it's always being added to um, so just like to stress that, you know, that there isn't a right and a wrong and it's always kind of evolving and we're all learning together. So this this first method is fused applique. So the benefits are it's really good for precision with all different types of shapes. And one of the things that we do have across the tapestry, there are 56 panels, there's 56 groups, there's 650 different stitches. Um, so across the panels, we've got so many different shapes from small shapes to bigger shapes, um, wavy lines, straight lines, people with clothing, you know, mountains, animal hair, all these different shapes. And some of the methods of applique work better for some shapes than others. So one of the things that I would say is when you have your panel is to, to have, have a good look at it and kind of just think about where the applique is gonna go. And what you want to do is to, to, it's really to use it to, it gives it that warmth and it gives it texture, um, but it can also be used to make certain parts of the design stand out um, you know more than others so it's it's got a kind of design purpose as well um but more about the fused applique it's it's really good for precision so if you've got a tricky shape or just shapes that are quite complicated it can be really really handy um because it just is much more precise um than other other um techniques can be 
it also creates a lot less bulk at the edges um, because in this method, it's a raw edge you just you're using. Um, you're not tucking the, the edge underneath the shape, so you don't get any bulk. And obviously, um, Harris tweed is a bit more bulky than linen. So when you start to turn the edge under, you, you can create bulk, especially if you've got lots of pieces of tweed that are really quite close together. Um, so that's why this is good for those areas if you have got lots of pieces of tweed that are going to be next to each other. It also creates quite a flat a, a flat surface to stitch on more than other techniques do. Um, that can that can be good or bad. It's about thinking: does that what you want to have for your panel? Um, so it's just about thinking it through. These are the things that it does. Um, and it's just thinking about with your group, is that what we want for, for this panel? And some panels will benefit from this technique more than others. Um, so it's it's ideal if you're going to attach the tweed to the linen before you start stitching. Um, so you're creating a surface to then stitch into and you would then go through the linen and the tweed and, well, and the bonder web as well, because it's in the middle. Um, so it is stitching through all of those layers. Um, and just a wee note there at the bottom of the slide, please don't use it if you have already stitched into the tweed um, or the linen that's being applied. Just another um, another wee warning there with the hot iron that um, that you need to use the to fuse the adhesive. Um, it will felt your yarns, your stitching yarns. Um, it will felt them. It can well. It doesn't always felt them, but it will flatten them. And then if you do it too much, it will. Um, it will felt them. So we'll just go on to the next slide, which is um, it is just a step by step um, of how to how I it's, this is how I do it, and um, people do it slightly different ways. And again, that's absolutely fine. I'm not saying here that you have to do it this way. I'm just saying this is the way that I do it um, and it works for me, but some people do do it a different way. Mainly they do it differently in the, in the tracing up part. Um, so, and I'll just talk about that in a minute. So first in picture number one, you've got the area that you're gonna trace. So this is quite, I picked this design, it's drawn onto the linen because there's a lot of wavy lines in the across the tapestry in the different panels. And um, these wavy lines that I'm talking about here aren't the wavy lines that, that tend to be for cords, you know, the brightly colored lines that go through. It's not really those lines that I'm talking about. The lines that I'm meaning are when you have, you might have, um, you know, that might be hills or mountains, or it might be water at the bottom of a panel. So there's quite a few panels that have this kind of, these kind of shapes. So that's why I picked it because um, hopefully this, this shape will be in some of your panels. Um, so on to number two, are you tracing the shape onto the bond web? And this is where I maybe do it differently to how some people might do it. I think it's just the way that my brain works, um, but I always trace it with the paper side of the um, bonder web down underneath and the adhesive side on top. That's just because my brain really struggles to reverse images. So you, you can do it a different way where you trace it onto the paper side first, but you then have to remember to flip your image and reverse it. So I kind of try and take that out of the equation for me, but if you do it that way, it's absolutely fine. Um, so I should have said as well, because um, that, Bondweb is it's just a kind of trade name. It's um, it's basically just a sticky paper. One side feels like paper and the other side feels like um, a kind of sandpapery feel. And that's where the glue is. Um, so I do it with the adhesive side up. And then that means you don't have to reverse it again. Then what you do, you roughly cut around that shape. So it's just a wee bit bigger than the shape that you're going to end up with. Then next, you, you put the adhesive side down onto your tweed and put a protective layer of fabric on top of it and then firmly press. You, and I do use, a, yeah, do firmly press it quite hard 
um, using the iron set to two or three. So you can see by that that it would felt your stitches if you've got it set to two or three because it does need to be a hot iron. If it's not hot enough, it, it won't work and then it'll fall off and you have to keep having to go back. And, and that was actually one of the things I think in the very, very beginning um, when we were doing this um, on the first panel, um, we found that I didn't have the instructions for hot enough iron. So we adapted that. So you do need to hold it down quite firmly and pressing it um, for five to 10 seconds and kind of go from one side of the shape to the other, pressing sort of for five, five seconds and then moving on kind of slowly over the shape. Um, and then it's, it is important to allow it to cool um, before you cut it because that helps the adhesive to set onto the fabric. If you try and if you try and do um, anything too soon before it's cooled, then you, you run the risk of the paper coming off um, before it's sort of set. Um, and then you cut the shape out and just carefully following your pencil lines. Um, and then the next step, you peel back the paper only. So you'll feel it, it's just the paper side that you've got and you just sort of scratch the edge. Um, and usually it'll come away quite easily. Um, if it doesn't, you can always scratch a little bit in the middle and try and tear the paper a bit. But you want to make sure when you peel it back that you're not peeling back the adhesive as well. You're just peeling back the paper. Um, and then number seven, you put, you're putting your piece of um, tweed with the adhesive that is now on it and you put the adhesive side down onto your linen back cloth and your tweed piece is on top and the adhesive is now in the middle um, and then I, I cover it you can cover it with a clean tea towel or just a piece of another piece of fabric um, say with a clean damp fabric that's in the instructions um, that the manufacturer provides I just um, sprayed this fabric with a water spray um, just quickly before I ironed it and that was enough um, and you're firmly pressing it again and you do need to be firm with a hot iron for five to seven, ten seconds again over the shape and again allow it to cool um, before you sort of check if it's stuck because if you don't allow it to cool sometimes you'll peel it back as so you need to allow it to cool and then just check and see is it attached um or not and if it isn't you should just need to repeat step eight um just i cover it again iron it again allow it to cool and then um check that it's attached so it's just it's quite it's quite methodical really so this piece here um, this is the this is what I was um, the outcome of what was on the previous slide. So this is the design, and these are the pieces of tweed that I put on using Bonderweb. So you can see um, there's three different pieces there, um, and the the bottom two um, because they haven't because they're sitting right next to each other. Um, I haven't gone around the edge of those with an edging stitch. Um, so you can leave those raw if you've got two edges that are, set, uh, are coming as close together as that. And then you can stitch over, over the top of them as if they were sort of one piece of fabric. Um, and, and that's enough for that to all hold absolutely fine. On the top of the middle piece of tweed, the kind of um, sort of yellowy green, um, I kind of call that one spring green because it's a nice yellowy green. Um, oh, I think you've got something in the chat. Oh, Jane's saying that she's it's gorgeous. You love it. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you like it. Um, the the middle piece, the sort of spring spring green piece, um, has got an edging. Um, on top, which is a heavy chain stitch. Um, so if you if you haven't got the two sides that are kind of coming right next to each other, like the bottom two, if you've got an edge and then you're going to embroider in the space above it, it is good to give it an edging stitch. Um, so it just finishes off that. It just holds the the sort of small frayed edges of the, the tweed enough so that it doesn't kind of look like it's fraying. Um, 
and so that for that one I used heavy chain stitch and for the one at the top I went around that one in a blanket stitch so you, you know that's you can do either or if you have other edging stitches that you want to use that'd be fine but these are just suggested ones and then I've, I've done a little bit of embroidery just in the middle section just to highlight that you can have you know, if you've got lots of, depending on your design, if you've got lots and lots of tweed all next to each other, it can be quite heavy. Um, it can be heavy to look at visually, but it can also be heavy, um, actually physically heavy and start to then kind of, um, you know, drag, affect the tension of the rest of the panel, kind of like um, create too much heaviness. So you can balance the you can balance it out by having some tweed and some stitching. Um, and that's that image is just illustrating how to do that. One of the things I did want to say was um, actually a stitcher last night. I um, was saying sometimes people have said, oh, it's quite tricky stitching through the layers. Um, you know, if you've got linen and tweed. Um, and then you're doing embroidery through the layers that is quite hard to get through all of those layers. Um, so you can use a, one of the stitches last night had a tip of using a thimble um, on both underneath finger and, and on top finger so that when you're pushing the needle through, um, pulling it out underneath that, you're sort of not getting sore finger pads. So that can help if you've if you've tried it and you found that it was sore with your fingers, that, that's just a wee tip that can help. Um, when I do the heavy chain stitch there, right um, as the outline, that's stitched into the linen, not stitched into the tweed. Um, and it's absolutely fine if it's just right, if it's right next to it, but it's in the linen. Um, rather than in the tweed, because that actually would be really difficult to do that um, through all of the layers. It's absolutely fine to do it through all the layers if you want to, but it's just so letting you know that you don't have to. OK, um, so what I've got next is just a few slides which have there's some um, quite a few groups who are, uh, have done a really great job so far with with using that technique with using fused applique um and that's just it's just worked really well for their panel for design reasons or just that that's just the way that they wanted to do it um so one of these is the this lovely black highland cow um from the us strands group and um i think they've done a fantastic job you can see all of these pieces um of tweed they've all been applied with bonderweb so that was a quite an early on um, picture that they had shared. Um, and they moved on. The next picture just shows how they've started to stitch in, into that. So they've been doing some edging, stitching, and they've been adding in some areas um, of embroidery in the spaces between as well. So you can see that um, when you see this image in the center, um, that there's there's some areas there to fill in. So who knows whether they'll do that with stitch or whether they'll do it with tweed. Um, we'll wait and see, but I think it's looking amazing. Um, it really is. Um, it's going to be so striking. It's just absolutely fantastic. So I think they've done an amazing job um, so far. That is the US strand. So the next one is the A9 stitch up group. Um, so, and I realized actually, oh, I should have changed this on, on the presentation, but the drawing on the left-hand side um, has got the hills at the top, but you maybe can't see them. They're, they're just above the heads of these faces, but you can see them on the right-hand side in the panel um, where you can see the faces, the outline of the face has been stitched and then the, these hills uh, mountains are at the top. Um, and that's the area that they chose to applique. Um, and they've done lots of stitching um, onto the tweed. Um, oh, you can see them. Oh, that's great. It's maybe just my screen. Uh, um, I'm sure it's my screen. Um, yeah, so you can see that they've stitched in um, quite a lot into their tweed 
um, and it's it's looking obviously gorgeous. So the piece of in the in the bottom right hand image, um, they've got um, some blue there for the for the water, and um, done gorgeous stitching into it. So it's kind of creating this texture. So you can really get this sense of how you know if you've got the tweed and then you've got stitching that's on top of it. That this um, sense this texture is just going to be so lovely, um, and just add something really really different um, to the tapestry. Right. Oh. So, oops, I've just gone too far ahead. Hang on. OK, so the next one that I've got to just show you as well, another group that's used this really well, is um, the Nessie Needlers. Um, they're based in Drumna Drocket and um, they've got this fantastic um, applique of Nessie and the hills as well, um, just up at the top which looking lovely and you can just see that it just makes it really striking having this Harris tweed and um, when that's all filled you know around it filled up with stitch um it just is going to look absolutely fantastic and they've edged that with a heavy I think that looks like it's a heavy chain stitch can't see quite closely enough but I think it's a heavy chain stitch that they've used to go around the edge and around the edge of their hills at the top as well um so that's looking lovely so that's Oh, sorry, don't know why it's clicking ahead. That was um, fused applique. Um, so the next technique is needle applique. Um, so this one, um, you don't use bo any bonder web for this technique. So you need to forget about everything I've just said um, because this, this technique's totally different. Um, and this one is it's hand it's basically hand stitched applique. It's called needle applique, or sometimes it's called needle turn applique. That was what it used to be called. Um, so oh, we've got somebody joining in. Um, so this one is suitable for either tweed or for linen. You can use either either fabrics. It's fine for. It's a really really good choice if you want to stitch into tweed or linen before you're attaching it to your panel it it you do have to turn the edges underneath in this technique a lot of quilters who are on the call tonight there might be quite a few quilters here and they'll be I'm sure familiar with this technique so if you've got people like that in your group then they're great people to help with this part of the project because it, it can be a little bit tricky um, and I would say that across the board, actually, with the groups, if you've got people who've used these techniques before, who can done that, then they're great to help everybody else as well in the group to kind of just share their knowledge around, um, because that will just help everybody to, to learn. Um, so this one, yeah, suitable for either tweed or linen is great if you want to stitch into a fabric and then attach it to the panel. So if you've got people who are living in lots of different places and it's really difficult to get together as a group, um, then this this is this one and the next technique will really help with that because you can stitch into them and then you put them on afterwards. Um, whereas the technique before you, you can't do that. Um, it's good for really simple shapes, um, such as journey stones and basic sh basic shapes. But if you're really experienced in it, you'll know um, that you can do much more complicated shapes. And that's great if um, if you've done that before. That's fantastic. It can be really, really difficult for to do um, more complex shapes this way. Um, but it's not impossible and um, you can sort of adapt it. So if you have got shapes that you would like to do this with, but you're not too sure about it, and um, then just come and you can ask me. Or if you've got somebody in your group who has done this before and is knowledgeable about it, then I'm sure they, they would also be able to help too. Um, so with this one, the edges of the shape are turned underneath, um, as I said, and you can use, typically you would use needle as you go around the shape um, or you can use your fingers to just turn it over um, as you go. But I'll go through it step by step in just a moment. Um, generally speaking, you need to have at least one centimetre excess around shapes. Um, it can be one centimetre for larger shapes and for smaller shapes, you can trim it down. You just don't want to trim it down too much. And I would say that it's about half a centimetre is about the smallest that you could go to, because if you use if you have less excess around the shape than that, 
it's really, really hard to get a clean finish and you get some of the frayed edges pop popping out and it can be really difficult to, to stitch down. So that's why it's um, saying that for the seam allowance. Um, it's just much harder if you've got a much, much um, smaller seam allowance. You don't use Appleton's threads to attach this um, because it would be too fluffy. What The idea when you're attaching this is that you're making the stitching invisible. Um, so it's just attaching it one piece to the top piece to the back cloth. So you use a fine, strong thread to do it. So it's going to hold it on. Um, and um, I've got stocks of linen thread that I can send out to your group. But I'm also going to send some of that out to the hubs as well so that they have that. The reason they haven't got it yet, um, or nobody's got this yet, is because nobody's really been at the stage yet of, of, of doing this because a lot of the journey stones will be appliqued on in this way. Um, so that's that's coming. Um, the thread that I've got is Guterman 100% um, linen thread. Um, yes, Jane, you can use your own thread, linen thread if you've got linen thread. Um, I've just got white um, Guterman 100% linen thread. Um, somebody asked last night whether you could use cotton. You could use cotton. It would be best to use linen because um, I'm, I just get a bit funny about that. I've always been told, you know, suit your suit your thread to your fabric. And because we're using linen and linen, but we are also using tweed. So we've got wool there as well. So I suppose I'm breaking my own rules. But um, yeah, linen, linen thread's fine. Cotton thread would be OK as well. It just it just needs to be really strong. A really strong cotton thread would be OK. Linen is is um, linen thread is stronger. Um, so that's the preference, but you can use cotton um, as well. So this is just step by steps um, how to do this technique. And um, I've just used really bright, bright colours. So um, embroidering on it so that you can see, just see it. Um, but I've used the white thread to go around the edge. So what you need is just your applique piece. You can see that piece has got a centimetre all around the edge. Did have a pencil line as well. You can maybe just see that. Um, you need all your thread and some scissors. Um, I did trim that down because it was actually quite a small shape. Um, it's probably about 10 centimeters just to give you an idea of scale. Um, and I just thought that's going to be a bit bulky when I try and put that um, behind, when I try and turn it under, that's going to be a bit bulky at the top where it gets a little bit narrower. So I um, cut it down to 0 0.5 centimetres all the way around. Um, and then number two, what you do, what I do, and again, this can, might be different to the way that you've done it. And this is just the way that I do it. If if you've got a different kind of method of doing it, this, that's fine. Um, you just, I just gently pinch the seam allowance so that you get a crease. Um, it's a, like a fold memory. Um, and that can just, so you don't iron it because you've got that stitching on top and you don't want to felt it, but you're just going to fold, you're just going to fold that um, so you get a crease, a nice crease around the edge, which just really helps when you're um, stitching it down. The next um, step, number three, you can pin it in place if you prefer. I didn't pin this in place because it was quite small and I thought I would get the pins. The you know, pins might start um, pricking me in my fingers. So I just did it with my hands. Um, somebody also asked last night whether you use a hoop for this part. I don't use a hoop when I'm doing this technique because I find it much easier to get a better finish by holding the fabric in my hand. Um, but if you've learned with a hoop and that's what you're comfortable doing, that's OK. Um, so pin it in place if you prefer. I know we always say in the guide it, when you're stitching, please don't knot your thread um, and try and kind of weave your weave your thread into the back of your embroidery stitches before you come up. But this in this instance, we are I am saying to please do knot the thread, not the end of the thread, um, because it'll just help to, um, to, to really keep this piece on. That's what you're wanting is for it to be. Um, you, oh, it's OK if you've been doing it on the journey stones. Don't worry. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry now if everybody's I don't want everyone to worry if they've got knots at the back. It's OK. Don't worry. Um, it's just it's just best practice kind of going forward. Once you've got start and stitching, you can kind of weave your um, you can 
weave your um, yarn into the back of your stitches before you start stitching. But it's absolutely fine if you if you haven't done that so far. Don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, so you're knotting the end of your thread, and then you you kind of folding the crease over, and you bring your knot your needle up through the the crease in the top piece first, so that the knot is inside the crease, and your needle and your thread is on the other side. And then you're going to sew down through the background fabric. You make a, a little short stitch along and before you come back up through the fabric and come in as close as you can to the side of the shape. And then you go into the crease line again and um, go a short way along um, inside the crease before you come back out of the crease. And then you go straight down again through the fabric. So it's one of these things that if you've um once you've done it once or twice you're just like ah right okay that's how to do it sometimes um reading the instructions some people learn it by reading instructions some some people learn it by looking at pictures other people learn it by doing it um so if you think it'd be helpful for me to just do a video of me actually doing it then i'm happy to do that as well um that's how i learned how to knit again after a long time was um on YouTube, um, just watching somebody's hands because I found that much easier. So I'm happy to do that if people would like me to. Um, so next step, number four, you're just using, you can use your needle just to turn the seam allowance underneath as you stitch. Um, you can just tuck it under with your fingers as you go and hold it in your hand. Just really depends um, on what works for you. And it is really good to have a practice with this technique. Um, before you try it on your panel so one of the things that came out of last night's call was that people wanted more linen to practice on um, so I'm gonna send more linen out to the hubs so um, that you can have access to more linen um, so the next picture just underneath number four that's been stitched all the way around um, with that technique um, and so it's totally held um, on you just finish it off by going through the back it's the back of the fabric and then running your um, excess thread through some of the stitches at the back before snipping it off um, and then you can um, I've used an edging stitch in the bottom photo just above number five that is just a chain stitch it's not heavy chain stitch that's just a chain stitch which I've gone around the edging it looks quite nice because it just finishes it off a little bit more you can't see any of the you know if you haven't quite managed to get all of your stitches so that they're completely invisible um, and you don't want them to be seen you can just finish it off with a stitch around the edge like that um, and what I did there as well is just to go through um, stitch through the linen back cloth for the edging stitch not through both layers if that makes sense so not through the linen back cloth and the applique piece just through the linen back cloth and go around and it just neatens it up um if you try to do it through too many layers with that sometimes it can end up getting really quite bumpy so that's why i did that for a sort of more of a smoother finish So these slides that I've got here um, are panel designs from the tapestry. And I've just put these up because these show where you could, oh, I'm breaking up. You can hear it now, but sometimes it's you're breaking up. Okay. Oh, if it if that happens again, if you can let me know. I'm not quite sure why that's happening. Um, it's okay now. Okay. Let me know if it happens again. I'm not quite sure why that's happening. Um, so these two panels here are just great examples of the shapes that you might use um, needle applique for. So the stones that, um, yeah, these are panels that have gone out to different stitching groups. The stones that are around the sides, so on the left-hand side, um, that's kind of like it called a starburst pattern. Andrew called that starburst of stones. So the stones around the side, the edges um, are for journey stones and you can applique those on um, or you can stitch directly into the linen. So there's there's choices there. So you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to do all of this with applique. You can stitch into the linen. And in fact, actually, when we were at um, the meeting with this group, 
uh, last week, um, one of the ladies working on this had stitched her, she'd done a couple of, of um, journey stones, um, but then she'd sort of simplified her design again and actually stitched it directly into the linen and it looked really great. Um, so you can do that as well, but it, it, I'm just have just got these on here to highlight where you might use needle applique, these shapes that are around that um, central image or the beach panel, which is on the right hand side, which has got these different um, different shapes on you could use needle applique for those shapes um as i said if you get really complicated shapes it can be really tricky um but it's not impossible and you might have people in your group who've done lots and lots of this before so i would share that knowledge around again so the next technique uh the third one that i've got in the guide is blanket stitch applique and we've got this lovely, I know I think Jan's on the call tonight, um, Jan's lovely Capacaley that she stitched, um, which is absolutely gorgeous and really um, got that lovely texture. Um, just love it. So this has been attached with blanket stitch around the edge. Um, so it's good, a really good choice for applying tweed that has already, already been stitched into. I'm, I'm saying that it's that and meaning as well, it's much better for tweed than linen i wouldn't recommend doing this with linen because linen the edge of linen frays a lot more it's a lot looser um and it frays a lot more and i think it could get a bit a little bit difficult um using doing this for linen shapes um i really recommend the needle applique for for doing those shapes and this technique for tweed um so if you've got tweed and you've you've stitched into it already, um, this is ideal. You can attach it using this method. Um, you can also apply a piece of tweed with no stitching on it um, and apply it with blanket stitch applique and then stitch into it through all the layers. And again, like I said, for um, the bond work, the fused applique, it, if you're going through all those layers and it is quite hard on your fingers, think about using a thimble on your the top finger and underneath as well, just to help so you don't get sore fingers. Um, it's a really great way to create texture um, because it's got a raw edge. So you're not turning the edge underneath that you can use a raw edge with this. Um, and it is possible to fray the edges of the tweed a bit. Some people have done that. I've got a photo a little bit later on. Um, I can show you of a stitcher that's done that. And that can work really, really well to suggest sort of areas of weathered stone, um, animal fur, hair that's got a more textured appearance. Um, so and you, you're using the blanket stitch all around the edge to um, to hold the tweed onto the background fabric. So next um, slide here, this is just, it is, this is the, probably the simplest method out of the three um, to do. And so that's why there's just not as many steps because it's much more simple. So you just need your shape cut, cut from tweed. You can pin it to the background cloth especially if you're trying to line it up with pencil lines, um, just to make sure you know it's the right size or shape, um, then you might want to pin it on. I've used pins with a round head here, but if you've got pins with flat heads, they're really good to use because they just lie flatter and you won't um, get your yarn stuck in them as you go round. But I, when I took the photos, I didn't have any of those to hand, so, um, but you can use those. And all you're doing is you're pinning your piece of tweed to the background cloth and then you're using blanket stitch to go around the edge of the shape, all the way around the edge, attaching it, going down in through the linen back cloth to attach it to the background as you go. Um, and then you can, like this piece of tweed hasn't got any stitching on it prior to be, it being applied. So I could stitch through both layers of fabric and have embroidery on there by stitching through all of the layers. And you can, as I said, you can uh, you could stitch into this first and then apply it using this method. Um, so hopefully that, that all makes sense. I wouldn't again recommend this for linen because of the edge of the linen, just it 
just can it just gives a better finish for the linen for it to have the edges tucked under um but everything that i've sort of said in this guide as i said at the beginning if there's anybody who joined the call a little bit later that these are suggested methods they're not the only methods of applique you know we've got lots of people with lots of experience on the project and if there's different methods that you want to use just let us know um you know and and if you have got lots of experience then please do share that around just so Okay, I just go on to the last slide, which is um, I was talking a little bit about how you could fray the edges of the tweed um, in the previous slide. And the image that's just on the right hand side on the bottom of the screen is um, a stitcher who has has done that, used that technique um, with lots of different pieces of tweed all blanket stitched on but some of the edges have been frayed and stitched into it a lot and created lots of different sort of and stitched in between the pieces of tweed to create texture um and then when I showed Andrew that he he really loved it and said it really suggested to him kind of old weathered stone um and and because we've got so many things that come from stone um in the tapestry so many so much imagery that comes from stones um it that can be a really nice way to do it um so these pictures here are just of a couple of the panels which are of um a celtic cross the head of a celtic cross um and you know that could be used quite nice when you think of like old you know weathered stone with lichen and different patterns on it um you could create a surface using that method quite nicely so that's me kind of coming to the end of the slides that i've got to show you hopefully I'm going to just stop the share just now and come back to the screen. Um, and what I'll do is I'll I'll unmute everybody. Um, I think that's probably the best way to do it. Oh, I think I might have unmuted you. Have I already? Let me see. I don't know if I know how to unmute you. Hmm. Right, people can unmute themselves. Yeah, uh, they can now. I just, yeah, I just changed the settings. So you can unmute yourselves if you want to ask a question. Thanks, Ben. Um, so if you've got any questions, you, you can put your hand up if you want to. You can type it in the chat. Um, you can just go ahead and ask um, if you've got any questions following that. So there is one in the chat already. For, um, have you or has anyone tried the needle applique for tweed stones? I wonder how bulky it would be with the turned over edge. Um, ooh, um, yeah, I, I have tried it and it is quite bulky. Um, it just depends. Um, I would say just try it and see, see what it looks like. Um, I thought it was quite bulky when when I did it, but maybe that was just me. So you might do it and it might not be as bulky. So, you know, I think if you want to try it, um, you you know, you could you could try it. Oh, somebody's put in the chat that it would loosen the weave of the tweed. Yeah, I think it, it might loosen the weave of the tweed as well. Um, what I would say is if if you want to try it, just try it and see it on um, some practice pieces and see how you get on and see what the finish is like. Um, and then, you know, you can think, oh yeah, that would be, that works really well, or actually it looks a bit bulky. Um, and, and you can just see it's, it's really good to um, try things out, you know, on practice pieces if you can, before you, you know, stitch them. Um, I mean, I do it all the time, try things, take them out. You know, do some stitching and think, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to take it out and do some more. Um, and it's it's absolutely fine to do that. Um, well, we're we doing this. All oh, right, okay. There's a question from Jane. Will we be doing this around our panel? Is that a question for me, Jane? Yes. Yes. If you've got journey stones. Um, if you've got journey stones that are made of linen, then yes, I would suggest needle appliquing them around the panel.
But what I would say is um, there was a group who was on the call last night and following um, this, they emailed me today and there was one lady in the group who who loves doing needle applique and has done loads of needle applique and said, please, please, can I do all of the needle applique to put the journey stones onto the panel? And everybody else in the group breathed a huge sigh of relief because she was really happy to do that. So it was a great you know, way to share it around. So she was going to do that and somebody else wanted to do the edging stitch around the edge. So um i think it just depends if there's if you're having any struggles with it i think don't don't struggle with it either if you feel like it's that's a step too far for your group or you don't want to try it um that's that's also absolutely fine and i would say in in that um situation to just get in touch we have got so many people on the project who like the lady in the group um yesterday you know would be really quite happy to do that for other groups as well um, so we have so many, so much stitching experience amongst all of us on the project. There's all of these people who are on the project that don't want anyone to feel stuck with anything. Um, I think there's another question there. I can't quite see all of it in my chat. Can you see it, Ben? I can see one that says, can I show the penultimate slide again? List, listing the steps of blanket stitch again yes because you didn't quite catch it I will just do that in a moment um just before I do it oh sorry Ben are you on mute and you can't let me see I can just ask you to unmute um, oh, there so um one question I have um our group um, Gaina stitches has one of the designs of the central, very simple image, and stones all the way around in a circle, starburst style. Yeah. Um, our central image is Shinty Six. We're unclear as to whether the stones in our design are to be journey stones, ours and or others that have already been completed, mm -hmm. or to be duplique stones designed to be specifically for our panel. Um, and then the journey stones would be used in other ways elsewhere or a mix. Um, and then we've not got our actual panel yet. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Oh, right. Okay. I'll need to speak to you about not getting your actual panel yet. Um, I'll, if you can maybe email, I think I've had an email from you, but I'll email you tomorrow um, about that. Um, the, it's a really good question. Um, and I'm really glad you asked it because about the stones around the outside, <clears throat> excuse me, because a lot of people have asked the same question. Um, so the answer is it's a mix. It can be a mix. It can be your journey stones from your group appliqued on. You can also use those spaces. You can either stitch directly into the linen and you can just treat it as another space to stitch if you've got things that you want to include from your area where you live or stories or things um sorry i've got a tickle i'm just going to take a wee sip of my tea um so you can um you can use those spaces to put your own designs into if you want to and you can also ask andrew to draw things for you to go into those spaces as well does that answer that question I think that was um, enough of the head. And there's also the wee designs. There's that little um, collection of just little, almost pictures. Uh, yes, shared. there are. Yeah. So if you're stuck for, um, if you want to fill in spaces and you don't want to do a, a whole design or you don't want to get a drawing from Andrew, you can also use this. Uh, there was the pattern book that Andrew drew. Um, which has been shared. So you can use that as well to fill spaces. What I would say as well, and that's and um, leading on from your question is that if you've got a lot of journey stones that have got a lot of content in them, so they've, they're kind of heavy on the storytelling side, it is quite good to balance those out with journey stones that are maybe more about texture or just a little bit less <coughs> to take in visually just when you think about putting them all together, 
you want to think about how that can be read visually. But that is a few steps further along than where we are just now. So at the moment, we're still at the stage of people doing their journey stones and getting their panels and stitching onto them. So um, that's a few steps down the line. But um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. Um, is it better for the journey stone to be orientated horizontally than vertically or doesn't it matter? It, I would say that what you're wanting to do is that it can be visually read by somebody who's going to be looking at it. So it's about thinking, you know, if it's going to look like it's upside down, you know, maybe think think about that. And um, there's lots of different spaces um, and do, lots of different places where the journey zones go. So I think it is good to think about the orientation of them and how that will look when it's all finished and whether you can tell what it is. Um, if you can tell what is better one if you can more clearly visually read it one way than another then put that in a space where it can be the right way around if that makes sense um i will go back and share the penultimate screen because i know somebody had asked about that just before i do um we this calls being recorded and we'll hopefully put it onto the YouTube channel so that people can access it again and they can watch it as a film. Um, but I can also share, last night, um, some of the stitchers asked whether I could share the, um, yes, yeah, Sheila, I'll unmute you. Um, I can share the PowerPoint as well. Did you manage to get unmuted there, Sheila? No, she's not. Can you, does your mute, is your, if you try to unmute yourself, is it not working, Sheila? I think, I think I'm there now. Oh, there, you there you are. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, we had a few queries, um, which Jane had emailed you about, which we haven't actually um, had a response to, but you've probably been far too busy. But one of the questions was, um, does Andrew sort of specifically want anything in our particular panel or is it our own interpretation? So it can, it, it's like a collaboration. So if you've got things that you want to put in there, um, what you can do is you can say, and some people want to have further drawings from Andrew for some of these spaces and some groups don't want to do that. A lot of groups have come to us with a, just a kind of roundup of their ideas. Um, to say this is what we're sort of planning is that okay because they don't want the ideas to be duplicated too much across the tapestry um, and that's great when that happens because you know we can kind of help to say you know there's a lot of the time people come in and, and it's great because they they've got totally different ideas to other panels there's no, actually not been any times really where we've had duplication happening um but it's something that people do worry about so I would say that it's probably if you're thinking about it like that, the best thing to do is just to email with the ideas. If Jane's already done it and I haven't replied, I, sorry, if I haven't replied yet. Um, we have got a list of people to get through, but I am working my way through it with Andrew. So those all get all those emails get shared over with Andrew. And then um, it just takes a little bit of time because obviously Andrew's also thinking about all of the ideas over the whole of the tapestry. So um Sometimes it can take a little bit of time for us to get back to you, but we will get back to you. On that particular point, then, can I just ask, what about the chords for the panel? Do we do do we do the chords for our particular panel, or just yeah. do the chords get done all together yeah. at the end? Well, um, so the idea is that the chords that you can do the chords um, <clears throat> if you want to do them. Um, so what's happening with the cords is that the cord making machines are going out to all the hubs and I'm guess um, the speciality yarns haven't arrived yet at the hubs but they are being sent out to the hubs mm. so that there will be um 
lots of supplies at, at the hubs and then the idea would be that you would ask the hub leader if you can use the machine and, and access some of the yarn to create cords for your panel. Okay, thank you. I've got lots of other queries, but I'll leave it because other people want to ask questions. So if you can get an answer to us on our email, that would be brilliant. Yeah, I will do, Sheila. I will. Lovely. Thanks very much for your questions. I'll, I'll be there tomorrow night anyway, so you might get another chance tomorrow. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you. I'll look forward to that. Lovely. Thanks. Thank you, Sheila. Um, if there is skin, is this generally not embroidered? Just a black outline of the features um, from Sue. Yes and no. Um, so I know in the Great Tapestry, I think um, that Angie did, I think I'm right in saying that most of the faces did have the black outline and then no stitching in the face. We have got quite a few faces in different panels um, over the tapestry and there is a mixture of um, people filling in the faces or not filling in the faces. So there isn't a hard and fast rule. Um, what I would say is when you're doing faces, it can be really quite difficult when they're stitched to make it look really effective. Long and, stitch short, long and short stitch is really good for faces, um, but you do need to really watch the color of your yarn as well. Um, you know, so it's, it's one of those things where you can, I think as a group, you need to decide as a group what your approach is gonna be to faces that you've got in a panel. Um, and if you want if you want any advice more specific advice for your panel then just to get in touch with an, with an email is that okay 